If you or anyone you know updated to iOS 8 this past weekend, there's a good chance you enjoyed some giggles with the predictive text engine. It's pretty clear that we're slowly crawling towards a post-QWERTY world, but how many non-QWERTY worlds already exist? QWERTY was conceived in the 1870s as a way to keep typewriters from jamming by placing the most commonly used letters away from each other. It's odd, then, that while most of us stopped using typewriters recently, QWERTY remains the standard layout for keyboards big and small. So if I type the word California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, -I -I you can see I got almost all the letters wrong. The most popular alternative is Dvorak, kind of like the Esperanto or Linux of keyboard layouts in that it has hardcore adherents who claim vast improvements with its usage. Yet most Dvorak claims of improved speed and reduced stress injury can ultimately be traced back to inventor August Dvorak. It's the same with other non-QWERTY layouts like Colmac and Norman. Should I learn Dvorak keyboarding? That's pretty esoteric. I heard it is a very efficient way to type. It's faster. I honestly have no idea what the deal with that video is, but the point is that Dvorak and its ilk are just variations on a standard keyboard layout, which frankly bores me. Let's get weird, weirdos. You know, people are no longer tied to their desktop. True. But this was never meant to be mobile. That's why we developed this. Continue. It types. The easy way to touch type without looking, using one hand or two. Right. It's ideal for typing when you're mobile. Or when you can't move much at all. If you want to see it, you got to come to the Venetian, Eureka Park, booth 73409. Yeah, I'm going to need a flight to Vegas right now. Dope. Corded keyboards represent a truly modern deviation from your MacBook's boring normal keyboard layout. It involves depressing single or multiple keys like a piano chord in order to register different letters. Press A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, then hold one thumb, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R. The basic concept of the corded keyboard has led to some unique alternatives. A, S, E, T, N, I, O and P. Which makes more sense to me than this, even though I think it utilizes the exact same principles. Closer to our contemporary QWERTY reality is Maltron, whose business mixes designs for individuals with disabilities and repetitive stress injury, and individuals who don't care if they look like a dweeb. A revolutionary design means minimal movement, maximum comfort and zero strain. Could they not have waited a day for her to get her voice back? With over 30 years of experience, theirs is the first keyboard to achieve RSI recovery. I love that video so profoundly, and I also find it hard to believe that QWERTY will remain the standard forever. Between smarter predictive text and experimental keyboards like Minim and 8-Pen, we're close to developing an intuitive form of writing that isn't based on keeping our typewriters functioning. I mean, this looks like the future, doesn't it? But who can predict the actual future? Maybe it's this. You can type using Psyche and in conjunction with a PC keyboard, do all the formatting and fiddling on that. Or you can use the Psyche exclusively. What do you think? Do you use a non-QWERTY keyboard or would you? Do you think it'll be the standard forever? Let us know what you think in the comments and be sure to subscribe for new episodes of This Exists every week. Be excellent to each other. Last week's episode was all about slow TV, a welcome respite from some heaviness recently in some of our videos. Let's see what you guys had to say. Stefan B compares the rise of slow TV to this hit from the 90s that some of you may remember called Screen Savers. My favorite being the Nihilist Pong Tournament. Fond memories of a lot of time spent staring at a fish tank uh, full of shitty fish. 
A Cool Stupid Dog said that bands like Sunno are kind of like the musical equivalent of slow TV, and I'm inclined to agree. A lot of comments were about ambient music being similar to this idea, but I think mm, those things are more like the CDs that you buy in like a shopper's drug mart to put a baby to sleep. And there's actually some artistic purpose behind a lot of what we've seen in the rise of slow TV, and maybe that's more like the experimental music of bands like Sunno. I'm inclined to agree. According to Dis Thoughts, the National 4 Wee's television station has been airing an empty parliament building after their scheduled programming concludes uh, for a long time, not advertising it, and I wouldn't know how to even check that out, uh, not being from the Faroe Islands, but apparently it's just a camera in the room and you see car lights driving by and then slowly the room brightens and then television starts. That's really weird. Denmark's weird. Dom Nolan brought up Twitch Plays Pokemon, which was Twitch's weird social experiment of allowing all of their users to play a single game of Pokemon through the chat window uh, of the player. This was a super interesting idea that involved more interactivity, I think, than a lot of slow TV, but brings up the whole idea of whether or not gameplay videos themselves fit into this category. And I think that they do, and it wasn't a connection that I made, but it's a super valuable idea, and thanks Dom and a few other people who mentioned Twitch Plays Pokemon and gameplay videos in the comments. Of course, Super Nerd Brothers mentioned Fish Plays Pokemon, which was a riff on Twitch Plays Pokemon that involved a fish playing Pokemon. I think this totally falls into that category, but to an even more sort of absurd, uh, bizarre level. And maybe that means you want to pay more attention, maybe it doesn't, I'm not entirely sure, but absolutely a sort of fascinating and strange experiment. Ligum.nu finally got to flex their bachelor's degree in film studies and inform us that this idea is actually much older than I maybe insinuated that it was and used to be called traveling actuality films. Maybe it still is. And a very early example was called A Trip Down Market Street from 1906. I don't know if from 1906 is the title. Uh, but it's interesting that this idea has been around maybe much longer than we or the Norwegians are pretending that it has been. Wayfair Angel makes a great point that I hadn't even originally considered around the value of slow TV or any sort of uh, slow traveling visuals for anyone who experiences mobility issues. Uh, and they bring up their own personal uh, struggle with chronic pain and how these, these videos can ultimately kind of provide an escape from being housebound or just from generally finding it difficult to travel to the places that are depicted in videos like this. And that is an incredibly valuable uh, part of a lot of what's being produced under the slow TV uh, banner and something that I previously had not even considered. This week in the Sam's Club, This Book Exists Club, I want to recommend Jeff Berner's Festival Man. Jeff Berner is an accordionist, a singer-songwriter, an artist who lives in Vancouver, and this is an amazing, totally short and incredibly readable fiction book. I think it's the first fiction recommendation on the show. Uh, all about uh, a manager, this sort of slovenly, terrible, but ultimately maybe redemptive human being uh, who's big on the Canadian folk festival circuit and in particular works with this otherworldly, brilliant uh, Inuit throat singer uh, who ultimately you know, goes off and works with Bjork. And uh, it's a sort of fascinating look. At, it's a character study and, and a great look at the, the festival kind of scene and also really interesting because last night, the night before we filmed this, uh, Jeff Berner introduced a, a Inuit throat singer by the name of Tanya Tagak at the ninth annual Polaris Music Prize Gala, which I produced. It was a big live show on YouTube. It was fantastic and a lot of fun. And Tanya ultimately won. And when I was talking about Jeff and Tanya to someone and I was talking about Jeff's book, I slowly came to the realization that the Inuit throat singer in Jeff's book was clearly modeled after Tanya Tagak. And when I found him, I was like, Jeff, your, your book is about Tanya Tagak, isn't it? And he was like, yeah. I was like, I didn't think that that person could possibly be real because the book just paints this absolutely otherworldly uh, portrait of this character and uh, ultimately this person is real uh, and just won the Polaris Prize last night. So I'd encourage you to read Jeff Berner's Festival Man and I would also encourage you to check out Tanya Tagak's Brilliant Animism which won uh, the Polaris Music Prize last night. And that whole stream is archived over on the Ox page. Again, I produced it, so uh, go check it out. I'm very proud of what we managed to pull off. And uh, music is great. Uh, I'm tired. It was a long night last night, guys, but I did kiss Mac DeMarco. No, for real.